consensus capital. So I look forward to hearing your talk, Andrew. Hello. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> I've been telling that bad joke for now three years, so and at least it's a new crowd. So here's our sexy Silicon Valley hockey stick. Uh, obviously, we have seen this tremendous increase in the search and the kind of fever of blockchains. And uh, before I give conversations or give talks on this, I like to show this slide. Basically, this is Goldman Sachs' is what if report. Every year, they essentially talk about forecasting planet Earth. This was last year's first page, bold underline. What if I told you the blockchain could disrupt everything? And the reason I show this is because this is essentially not just an upgrade to financial services, but this is essentially upgrade to the database and an upgrade to the internet. And it's going to affect every human being, every company, every machine that uses database technology and the internet. So before going into the future, we like to kind of dig into the past. And what I'm showing here is essentially the first computers. They were the size of May. People in lab coats would essentially monitor them, and their output was paper. And in 1961, this gentleman, Edgar Codd, created the first relational database. This was the first time data was essentially stored and queried and, and put in order. At the same time, or just slightly thereafter, we had our first intranets. In 1969, we had one Stanford with UCSB and Brigham Young. In 1970, MIT added a node. And the kind of the key takeaway here is that the database and the internet grew up separately. And we, as humans, are accessing databases essentially through internet service providers. My first internet service provider was AOL. I was A Keys 96. That was the year that I got my first screen name. And the internet essentially turned into this, I would say, oligopoly, where we access information through probably at most 50 to 100 internet service providers. And I respectfully submit for your consideration that there are issues with this. We've got a Gini coefficient where you've got 80 human beings having the same net worth as the bottom 3.5 billion people on Earth. You've got all sorts of hacking. You've got your Equifaxes of the world. Uh, you've got the ability for people to just essentially manipulate the data. In, in Enron, Arthur Anderson's case, they just literally went in and changed the uh, structures of these SQL databases. So uh, we've actually had pretty good uh, displays today of smart contracts. But for those of you in the room that aren't technical, this is essentially a smart contract. And basically what it's showing is the sale of a website from counterparty A to counterparty B. You've got your buyer, your address, your seller, your address, date, the amount. And if counterparty B pays counterparty A, we change ownership. And we're all essentially understanding now that we can have companies that essentially clear and settle all of planet Earth's money replaced by smart contracts. And that's an easy one for kind of the 30-year-old unsexy DTCC. But what about the cool Silicon Valley Uber? Um, you essentially are now creating price discovery mechanisms for the cost of intermediation. What is the middleman worth? I'd submit that Uber has a spectacular user experience. They provide insurance. They provide reputation, those five stars at the end of the Uber drive. Uh, it's very important. But you could essentially have a smart contract and a GPS algorithm that does the same type of work. But where it gets more interesting is that Uber really isn't kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. They're essentially intermediating a marketplace. 
And what we're going to see now is essentially n-sided, multi-sided marketplaces. Uh, here we could have an insurer insure the smart contract. You could have a lender lend on it. And I think what these technologies are essentially going to do is create these multi-sided marketplaces. So here we are at an asset management uh, conference. And what I think we really need to understand is that Basically, this is the first time where all of our assets are going to be natively digital. Gold, oil, uh, bushels of hay, uh, Beyonce concert tickets. Everything is going to be essentially natively digital. And this just gives you an idea of where we are. This is just showing Bitcoin. Um, and what can essentially be the effect of this technology on the total global economy. This is just a slide showing kind of the diversity in the cryptocurrencies to date. So uh, kudos to Joel Monegro. Uh, he has done a lot on thinking about kind of the application layer and the blockchain layer. And I put a little bit inside of his boxes. But essentially, what we're showing here is that in the past, in the traditional internet that we know now, uh, the application layer was essentially capturing all the value, while the protocol layer essentially was, was free. Um, and as this evolves, in these kind of 2.0 blockchains, we're seeing that the protocol layer is actually capturing the majority of the value, while the application layer is getting substantially less. And, and the one little addition that I, that I made to this slide was kind of bifurcating, quote unquote, the protocol layer, because I think we can start to delineate kind of a protocol for infrastructure and then a protocol at the application layer. And I think Melonport is a great example, ZROX, Gnosis, of these kind of application layer generalized protocols on which people can build skins on top of. So what is this going to feel like to us? So, so I think what, what we're going to see is that the user experience is going to remain somewhat similar to what we have in our present day applications. But essentially, your browser, instead of it being Google Chrome or Safari, essentially, your browser is going to be your identity. It's also going to be your wallet. It's also going to be your login. It's also going to house reputational attributes. And it will also be your entryway to these peer-to-peer -peer networks. And then rather than having the application layer derive all of that value, you're going to be essentially transferring value from your intermediaries to counterparties of a transaction. So uh, this, is, I, this is a slide I really like. Uh, this shows the amount of apps that Apple created in 2007 through uh, 2017. And if we remember, obviously, the dot-com bust, that happened in 2001. And, and I think it's interesting, as the human species is evolving, we're essentially building applications for protocols that are not yet defined. We've got smart guys like Sunny building these kind of connector protocols. And we're actually building these applications that are not yet defined. So just kind of an update on the Ethereum protocol. Basically, yesterday, we have included ZK Snarks into the protocol. So now you can have private transactions. And then there's various scalability upgrades. So uh, quickly on consensus, we are more of an ordinary toddler than a startup these days. We're now 350 people, offices in New York, San Francisco, Toronto, Dubai, London, Johannesburg, South Africa, Romania, Chennai, India, and Singapore. And I'm sure a few others that I forgot. Uh, long story short, we, have, we operate across five pillars, if you will. So first is application layer. Uh, we maintain three of the eight implementations of the Ethereum protocol, Java, Haskell, .NET. Uh, above that, we build developer tools. So we uh, created Truffle, which is the most downloaded developer environment for blockchains, full stop. We've also created Infura which is essentially like Akamai for blockchains. Um, all of the applications that you saw today had that little uh, cat called the MetaMask. We built that.
for basically a Google Chrome extension to do uh, quick transactions. So above the developer tools, we've created what we call core components. So these are reusable open source standards that we think should be contributed to the community open source so we don't have to recreate the wheel. So we helped a lot with the ERC20 token standard. We do a lot in identity, registry systems, reputation systems. And then above that, we build applications. So we're building everything from decentralized poker to uh, financial contracting, uh, financial reporting, and kind of everything in between. And we run that side of the shop in what's called a venture studio model, where idea becomes a project, project becomes a product, product can spin out to be a separate company. Um, so next, we have enterprise consulting. So a few clients, Microsoft, JP Morgan, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, British Petroleum, Procter & Gamble, uh, the Emirate of Dubai. Essentially, we're teaching people what the heck the blockchain is at a developer level, a policy level, at a business level. We elucidate use cases and sandboxes and then spin them out into production environments. Above that, we have education. So we just rolled out what's called Consensus Academy. We had 1,300 people apply for Consensus Academy. We accepted 130 or 10% of them to this, oops, uh, in, into this program where they had a 10-week uh, remote education. And on week 10, they were flown to Dubai. And if they passed the test, we offered them a job. Um, we're also doing that for project managers, MBAs, attorneys. And, and we have different kind of levels on if we're just doing that as an in-house hiring mechanism or an outsource opportunity. And lastly, we have uh, capital. And I'll discuss that a bit in depth in a bit. So as I said before, this is the next generation of the database. And this is not just affecting financial services. And I just wanted to kind of widen the lens because we have had a lot of talk on specifically financial services. But we're working on supply chains, energy, government, advertising, healthcare, entertainment, et cetera. So our newest pillar of work is consensus capital. And it's essentially a marketing umbrella for a few distinct businesses. And uh, so the first one is ventures. Uh, it is being run by a woman named Kavita Gupta, who's here. If you can just give a wave if anyone's interested in speaking to her after. Um, Basically, we closed a $50 million internal fund, and we have a $100 million external fund uh, investing up to $1 million in pre-seed, seed, and equity. Uh, Kavita came from Eric Schmidt, chairman of Google's family office, where she was running it. Uh, World Bank, IFC, McKinsey, she's awesome. Uh, next, we have James Slazis, who's here as well, who's actually doing asset management and basically going so deep that essentially making this available for pension funds. Uh, maybe a, a, the, the New York State Teachers Pension Fund has $10 billion, and they allocate 100 basis points, 1%, to alternative assets. And of that 1%, they may allocate maybe 20 basis points to this asset class. So we're the weird of the weirdest. Um, and we're, we're, we're creating the ability to have kind of custody, auditability, uh, financial reporting, and uh, basic exchange metrics for trade execution. Um, and so, uh, so a pension fund could participate in this risk. Um, lastly is token foundry. Um, and basically, uh, we have a bit of token fever these days, I think. I think it is somewhat of a frothy market in uh, kind of looking at history, uh, from 10 years after 1996, in 2006, 86% of the companies from the internet era were gone. So 14% of them actually were alive. And I believe we're gonna have somewhat similar metrics, and maybe even more uh, today. And, and I think that there is kind of very specific 
guidelines, and I think Joey nailed it, talking about kind of how these companies should, should work, uh, what tokens should do, uh, and, and basically we help with a very formulaic process of kind of the Gantt charts of how to model the token, how to audit the smart contracts, how uh, what jurisdiction you should consider if you are uh, considering doing this work. And uh, we, we walk companies through that. Um, so one that I'd like to talk about, and, and I just use this as an example about token fever, is, is one named Prize. Gil Penchin is here. And um, this is a great example of a company that is essentially finding places where there's opacity. Uh, the lottery market, where essentially the states, uh, a lot in Asia, they take up to 80% of the lottery revenues. And in this, you can essentially have provably fair sweepstakes, and I think it's a very compelling uh, market. So a few things. <laughs> Token fever, right? It's cool. Um, create a community and not a banner ad. Uh, th there's a lot of froth in this. I think, again, 86% of these are going to go to zero. Don't be the Dow. Uh, I think Joey's uh, conversation on Oriente is priceless. We have also created what's called consensus diligence that does smart contract auditing, formal verification. Don't be like Enron. Uh, we have done a lot of work on the financial reporting aspects of token sales and just essentially uh, maintaining proper uh, accounting for these types of tokens. Uh, so other things to think about is your jurisdiction. Obviously, China says no tokens. Switzerland's a great place. Also, also Liechtenstein's worthwhile. It's 8.5% capital gains versus what could be in the mid-teens here. Um, and that's the overview. Cheers. <laughs>